In Women in Film Happy Hour. We are women who write for film, television, and media. We believe that no story should go untold, and we want to hear your story. Now, let's join in for today's radio broadcast. We want to be very sensitive to the subject matter that we will be tackling today, uh, tonight in some areas. Um, and we have no other than the lovely Nicole J. Um, so say hello, Nicole. Hello, everybody. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Hi. <laughs> She's Hi. actually on the other side. She's on the other side of, um, you know, we, we, she's normally interviewing. But mm -hmm. now she's given me an opportunity to, uh, to interview her so she can tell her story. And she's not, um, she's very... Uh, popular on this at this time because it's uh, October is domestic violence awareness month and okay. every month Nicole J has been blessing us with her story um, to reach out to others to let you know that there is a way of escape and you can overcome so right. welcome everybody welcome 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 um, welcome <laughs> so oh, I'm um, we definitely want to just go ahead and get in the show. We don't want to waste any time because we only have an hour to do it. And so mm -hmm. we're going to get started. So thank you guys again for joining us. First, um, I want to go ahead and I got a definition I picked out for domestic violence. So there's so many um, things that describe what this, what this thing is, but I want to read the one that I, I kind of liked uh, the definition of how they put it. Um, it says we define domestic abuse as an incident or pattern of incidents of controlling, threatening, degrading, and violent behavior, including sexual violence, in the majority of cases by a partner or ex-partner, but also by a family member or a carrier, like a caretaker. It is very common. In the vast majority of cases, it is experienced by women and is perpetrated by men. That is the definition that I liked about domestic violence. Um, and there are a lot of things that we're going to be going over tonight. I'm going to be asking um, Nicole some very uh, intimate and personal questions. Um, Nicole, if, if it's going too far, just say, hey, you know, just pump your brakes, pump your brakes, and I'll do so. Uh, but in the meantime, um, I definitely want to give um, some statistics to our audience, if I can, Nicole. Oh, yeah. Sure. Okay. All right. So domestic violence um, statistics, um, nearly 20 people per minute, uh, I'm sorry, 2,000 people per minute are physically abused by any intimate partner during one year. This equates to more than 10 women and men. And I think it's 20,000. I don't think it's 2,000. I think it's 20,000. And I would definitely have to um, confirm it, but I think it's 20,000 because when I read it, I said, oh my God, that's a lot of women. So I think it's 20,000. Um, one in 15 children are exposed to intimate partner violence each year and 90% of our children witnesses domestic violence. Okay. One in four women experience intimate partner physical violence, sexual violence, Stalking with impacts physical injury, fearlessness, post-traumatic stress disorder, contraction of sexually disease. Okay. One in three women have experienced some form of physical abuse, such as slapping, shoving, pushing, but in some cases are not considered, those are not considered domestic violence. So in some cases, if the slap is too hard, I would consider it domestic violence because it hurts. <laughs> but in some cases, they're not considered uh, domestic. Um, one in four women have been victims of severe violent beatings, burnings, strangling by an intimate partner in their lifetime. And this is the last, this is, this is, this is, uh, I got two more to go. So bear with me. So on a typical day, there are more than, I think this is where the 20,000 come from. On a typical day, there are more than 20,000 phone calls placed to domestic violence hotlines nationwide. 
Okay, so I think I was correct on the first one saying nearly 20 people per minute. So it is here where it says 20,000 phone calls come in nationwide on a typical day for domestic violence. And the last one is the presence of a gun in domestic violence situations increases the risk of homicide by 500%. That's a lot. So not 100, but 500%. And so um, today's topic, we want to be very sensitive on how we handle this matter. Um, because if it's not domestic abuse, it can be something else that a person is going through in the relationships that's very toxic, that is very harmful. And so um, we know that, well, I've been told growing up that um, whatever we allow in our adult life, that we've somehow, whether it's good or bad, we somehow was inspired by it or uh, we witnesses, witnesses in a uh, behavior of some sort. So we either follow it or we mimic it. And so this is where we bring Nicole in. So starting off with the questions that we have for Nicole on today, we want to ask how, tell us about Nicole first. Tell us about Nicole and then we'll go into our questions. <laughs> Who is Nicole? Who is Nicole? Um, I am a domestic violence um, advocate. Um, and the reason why I do this is because, you know, when I was going through it, uh, they didn't have these type of resources or people reaching out or explaining, you know, um, the severity of being in a domestic violence relationship. So, um, and I made a promise to myself as well, that if I ever were to make it out, that I was going to make sure that no one else um, would have to go through this without hearing my story. And so um, I grew up in a, a, at an early age in a small town in Texas. Um, it, when I got in elementary school, I was, um, going back and forth from Texas to LA. Um, and then eventually as a young girl, I moved to Los Angeles. Um, when I moved to Los Angeles, uh, you know, it was a whole different ball game. You know, I was exposed to a whole different um, type of lifestyle. Whereas in the, in, in the South, it was more of a country type of um, living. You know, everybody knew each other, everybody kind of stood together. And then I moved to South Central California um, where it was pretty much considered like a ghetto. And, you know, a lot of gang violence, a lot of drugs, a lot of things going on. Um, so, uh, you know, I felt vulnerable there. I felt alone there. Um, I really didn't have um, family there. Uh, so it was kind of just me by myself. Um, and I, I made a way for myself. I was very uh, fortunate to go to a good schools, good schools, and I learned, um, I got my education. I went on to uh, college. I graduated from California State University of Los Angeles with a bachelorette in science. Mm -hmm. um, God has always blessed me with uh, good jobs. Um, I worked for Los Angeles Unified School District. I worked for National Cash Register. I, um, you know, always had, you know, banks, <laughs> you name it, I, mm -hmm. I was blessed. Um, and then in my early 20s, um, God blessed me even more to be able to do something that I love. I am a writer and I uh, was a ghost writer on the Jamie Foxx show as well as D.L. Hewley. And um, that was one of the highlights of my life. Um, after all of uh, the glamour, <laughs> I ended up getting married. Um, I have two children, two beautiful daughters, and I have a grandson, the love of my life. Everybody knows King. <laughs> and um, uh, I ended up being married. I was married for 13 years. I am divorced now. Um, after my divorce, uh, well, actually, 
Um, so I lived in Los Angeles and then after uh, I was married for 13 years and I moved back to Texas. Um, and so I ended up starting my own uh, TV show, Real Talk Chronicles. And it aired for two years on PBS channels here in Houston. Um, then I, I kept feeling this urge, this urge to do something. Um, um, and so I didn't know what it was at first. And, um, you know, the more we might watch the news, the more things, you know, are happening in the world. Mm -hmm. And it focused in on my past. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 it really started from, you know, seeing young women being murdered due to domestic violence. And it took me back, Joan, it took me back to my younger years um, when it was happening to me. Mm -hmm. And I felt so fortunate. I felt fortunate to be alive. I felt fortunate to, you know, be able to tell my story because, you know, I kept hearing so much about, you know, young girls being murdered and young girls being in domestic violence relationships and can't get out and, 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 and I thought back to that, to that promise that I made. And I, and, and I eventually started speaking out. I started speaking out about domestic violence. I um, joined a few organizations here in Houston and I started traveling all over Texas telling my story. And um, I end up on a reality show. It hasn't been released yet, but I, I did end up on a, a reality show uh, telling my story and going through the uh, process of healing. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's where I am here now. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're grateful to have you. And we, we appreciate you so much. But actually, um, you know, when, when, you know it's, sometimes it's so traumatic, uh, the things that we go through, we hate to go back and revisit to help someone else. But we thank you from actually coming back and helping, you know, those that are in need and to, you know, let us know that there is a way out and there is life after, you know, those traumatic experiences. And so tell me, so how was life for you as a child? Um, so in order for you to get in that situation, um, by you getting into that uh, relationship and kind of staying there, um, what did that have an impact on you as far as your childhood is concerned? Did you witness that? Did you see that or? Yes, um, I did. As a child, um, I was introduced to domestic violence at an early age. You know, I saw it happen a lot. I saw um, a lot of uh, violence and um, I, I believe later, it, it ended up having an effect on me. Um, but I think what mostly uh, that was really, you know, uh, that play, play, played a part about it was I grew up without a father. And um, when I say that, I say my biological father. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I just always used to think that if I had my father, I would have made better decisions. Mm -hmm. If I had my father, I, you know, probably wouldn't have ended up in that relationship. Mm -hmm. um, going to sleep as a young girl and hearing screams and um, at a very young age coming home and blood is everywhere and um, having to move from place to place, you know, um, it, it was very uh, traumatizing, you know. I, I really lived um, a, a hard, for a kid, I would say, it was, it, it was hard to see those things um, going on. Okay, and, and, and so the first sign of your abuse, was it verbal or was it physical? What was the first experience you had with abuse? For I me, okay. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Okay, so the first time, um, no, actually, I was a teenager. Um, the first time that I got hit, I was 18 years old, and I had just started college, and I had moved on campus, 
and my boyfriend my abuser at that time um we had been together for uh 45 years at that time so this was my first boyfriend my first love riding bikes together having egg fights it was what i called a very loving friendship relationship for 45 um, years there was no abuse at all no abuse wow no abuse mm -hmm. until mm -hmm. i got to college and i moved into my dorm and i remember the night vividly i mean um we were sitting down in my dorm and actually unpacking some of my things and he asked me you know uh what are you doing later and i said oh i'm going to a party that's going to be on campus mm -hmm. and i'm going to hang out and he was like no no you're not and that was the first time that it came to him telling me what to do you know and i was like yes i am <laughs> mm -hmm. and um he slapped me and he slapped me really hard to the point where i started crying um i was in shock more than anything um because like i said he's he had never hit me um and we were so close and um you know the hurt just started settling in and i and i kind of froze for a minute you know staring at him like you know i didn't understand what was really going on and it was silent for a minute and um i kind of you know because he slapped me so hard kind of like fell back on the bed um and so as i was to get up he moved when i moved and as if he's blocking me and i'm saying what are you doing you know um you you gotta leave because you, you just hit me you know and um my at that time my roommate came um and and of course she didn't know what was on going on but she was coming in moving her stuff and so that kind of broke the ice mm -hmm. so he ended up um leaving mm -hmm. and um we didn't talk for a couple of days after that um and excuse me and um after that i so, i you so know your, I, thought, your thought so your thought after that was like um it was like just a moment that he was did you how did you how did you how did you, how did, how did you make that okay in your mind did you say he was having a bad day or this just happened once how did you process that right and 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 over the over the couple of days that we were separated mm -hmm. i was thinking you know um because i moved away mm -hmm. and i moved into my own place you know on campus i was feeling that he was feeling like he was going to lose me or you know it, it was something wrong with him you know mm -hmm. accepting the way our lives were going in different directions and i you know i just said oh you know i kind of blew it off in a sense um because remember i was only 18 and so i'm thinking you know what i'm gonna tell him you can't do that and you know he's gonna he's gonna accept that and that's gonna be fine mm -hmm. little did i know um and so uh after those couple of days you know we end up talking on the phone and he apologized you know and of course i gave my spiel this you know <laughs> you're not gonna be hitting me <laughs> you know mm -hmm. as if you know and so the next time it happened mm -hmm. it was at his house um and it was bad it was really really bad i mean we were outside um and he threw me in the ground he you know took his fist and he was hitting me in my face hitting me in my chest pulling my hair um it was it was awful it, it you know and the whole time i'm thinking like oh my god you know what am i doing what is happening here um i i never lifted a hand to hit him back because I was so in shock. I was afraid, mm -hmm. um, afraid because 
it took me back to my childhood when I would see things happening. And if you did fight back, mm -hmm. you would be hurt more severely. Yeah. So I, I think I had picked that up where I couldn't do that. I just wanted to get away from him at that time. Um, I remember my lip was b busted. I remember my uh, hair was, you know, pulled out in certain places and I was dirty. And yeah, how, I did, remember you, how did you how did you hide that from your loved ones in your family? How, how did you hide? Did you stay inside until the bruises went away or you, you came, became mentally strong again? How did you hide that from those that is closest to you? I lied. Okay. I lied. Um, I fell. You know, I remember this is one of the most, and uh, <laughs> one of the most embarrassing moments that I had was when I graduated from college. Mm -hmm. um, we, he jumped on me um, a few weeks before it was time for me to walk across the stage in college, right? Mm -hmm. and he broke my arm in three places mm -hmm. and when I went to the doctor I begged the doctor don't put a cast on my arm please don't put a cast on my arm because my entire family was coming from Texas to see me graduate and and I had to walk across the stage mm -hmm. um and so when I came home, my mom was like, what happened? You know, what happened? And I said, oh, I fell. I fell out down some stairs, I, you know, in campus and, and, and I broke my arm. And um, do you think when, when, you know, when you've been abused and you're trying to hide it, do you think that your loved ones already know they're just kind of like waiting for you to say it? You no, my, 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 my mom didn't know. Okay. And my friends didn't know. I, um, I hid it pretty well because um, one thing about domestic violence is you learn to mask. You learn to hide things very, very well. Mm -hmm. um, only person that I can remember that I really couldn't hide it from was my supervisor. Mm -hmm. My supervisor would, I think, I think she used to watch me all the time mm -hmm. and when i would come to work you know she would make little uh hints or say little things and I, you know of course i would quickly you know shut it down but to me she knew that i knew mm -hmm. what was going on and and she never straight out said it but she would give me you know implications that she knew what was going on mm -hmm. um Go ahead. Let me ask you this. Um, after the second and the third time and the fourth time and to cause you so much pain, um, was there a pattern when he would actually uh, hit you? Uh, was there a pattern that triggered him? Some, did something triggered him to do that? Or that He just felt like when he was in a bad mood, he was just going to use you, you as his, his... No, drinking triggered it. He, 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 he drank a lot. You know, and, um, you know, once he would get, you know, under the influence, I already knew that it was going to be a problem. Um, mm. And so, um, yeah, that, 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 that was definitely a, a sign that, that something was going to happen is, is the drinking. Okay. Um, also, anytime I wanted to leave and go somewhere, mm -hmm. that would start it you know, without him, mm -hmm. oh, it, it, that was a problem. Um, I remember uh, one time I was getting dressed and I had my clothes all laid out. You know, remember I'm in my 20s, so I'm trying to enjoy life too. Mm -hmm. um, I was doing well in school and I had my clothes all laid off on the bed. And, he, and this was like my favorite outfit and he just cut it up, cut it up oh. in bitty pieces. And- um, You wouldn't leave. So I couldn't go. Okay. So I couldn't go. And, and um, so what did he say? What like tell us some some of the um, excuses that he used? Why he did what he did? 
like was did he say because you know i was in the i was having a bad day or there was a bad day at work he never explained himself what what, what was his explanation you mean afterwards yeah. um what he would the, the apologies yeah. mm -hmm. um the apologies were you know i don't have anybody in my life you know he always made me feel guilty about his situation um uh uh, you know, you're the only person that I have, and uh, I did that because you know I didn't want I didn't want you to leave me. I didn't want you to be alone. Um, you know, I, I didn't want to be alone, or um, uh, you know, I need help. He would tell me a lot. I need help. You know, something wrong with me. I don't I don't know what it is. You know, um, it was always you know uh those apologies oh my god I, I don't even know how it helped me so long mm -hmm. um after i think about it now mm -hmm. you know um but uh, yeah he he always had these you know um you made me do it because you were trying to leave me or you know it was always a a, a um and excuse that it was all back to you that you were the problem. That I was the problem, that I was the problem. And um, um, you know, the clothes that I wear, if you, if you, if you, you know, if you wouldn't dress like that, if you didn't wear those pants, you know, and you know, uh, you know, I wouldn't have done this. I mean, I remember one time I was at a club with my girlfriend, Coco, I, you met Coco. Mm -hmm. And we were dancing on the dance floor and I mean, we were cutting up girl and all of a sudden I went flying across the room and Coco was looking at me and I could see all the fear on her face. And then when I realized what has happened, what I was kicked, he kicked me across the room Goodness. in a full club. And, and then I saw him coming toward me and she was like run you know and 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 i and i started running and i remember the bouncers coming and trying to break it up in the club and everything and some kind of way we got out of there um without him um catching me and you know we we got in the car and we left and that was one of the times where i was questioned for the first time about what was going on and i and i made excuses for him mm. and i said well it was probably because we were dancing with those guys and the way i was dancing with the guy you know um is the reason why he did that and we kind of you know she, she 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 reached out to me in a sense and i'll never forget that because she said you know what coco um and that's my nickname too. <laughs> we both had the same name. And she said, you know what, Coco? I, I really think that you need to leave him alone. I really think that he's gonna hurt you. And um, she was like, because I saw tonight, what I saw tonight is that, you know, he's violent. And he, you know, he, he, you know, cause, cause they couldn't calm him down. He was really trying to get to us. Um, and, um, and she was saying, I, you know, this is the first time that this happened. And, and of course I know it's not. And she said, so you don't want this to happen again. You need to, you need to leave him alone. And, um, anytime after that, that she would ask me about anything, I would tell her no. You know, no, that never happened again. That was just that night. I believe it was because we were out, you know, partying and and he he saw me. Mm -hmm. Um okay. so yeah. Did so after, um so after after Coco found out, was there a sense of I know there was a sense of embarrassment, but at that point you still remained, right? So at yeah. that point was that love or, I mean, what did you lose from all of the time he's been treating you bad now and someone else knows about it? What was the respect like for him? Yeah, um, let me tell you something about me being in this domestic violence relationship. Um, 
I never stopped loving him. However, I did see him in a different light. Meaning, as far as respect, I didn't, I didn't respect him anymore. I wouldn't disrespect him, but I didn't respect him as a man in my life. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what that looks like is that, you know, um, I didn't want to go places with him anymore. Um, I didn't want him to touch me. Um, and I thought by me doing those things, that he would eventually just go. Um, and then I had formed in my head, and because domestic violence, and you, you read the, the, the statistics, it's a controlling thing. So I had it in my head that, you know, you're going to leave him, but you're going to go back because you love him. Mm -hmm. And I believe that was some of the reasons why in the beginning, I wouldn't leave. And then I kept wanting to go back to the old times, you know, when we were friends and we went shopping together and, 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 you know, um, we hung out, you know, we went all to the amusement parks and we just did everything mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking we were going to always get back to that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, coming out, finding out about his family history, you know, um, because he came from a domestic violence um, family as well. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, him saying, you know, I, I never had, you know, this type of love. I never had, you know, anyone in my corner like you, you know. And so it made me feel like he's going through something, he's going to get better, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but as time started to pass, I became fearful of him. And that's the reason why I didn't leave. I was afraid because you got to, you got to realize once, you know, I, I tried, I, I moved away. Mm -hmm. I've lived all over Los Angeles. When I tell you from the Valley to Inglewood to the outskirts, Alhambra, um, Los Angeles, I lived all over because I was moving. Mm -hmm. I've left clothes, I've left furniture, you know, I, you know, and I, and I lived in hotels. I did it all um, because I was trying to get away from him. Okay. And because we had the same arena of friends, mm -hmm. we had, he knew where I worked. <laughs> he knew my every, every move. Um, and so he would always find me. He would always find me. And when he would find me, I would be so afraid. And I would go back. Have I would you, go back. Have you ever, um, so I'm quite sure you called the police for him before though, right? Yes. I, well, our neighbors, our neighbors used to call the police. Um, I remember one time we were renting this house mm -hmm. and, um, the the owner of the house lived on like right next door mm -hmm. and you know one day i went over there to pay pay the the rent and she said i hear you scream at night mm -hmm. i hear you scream at night and she said and every time that i hear you scream i'm gonna call the police and she was like what can i do mm -hmm. to help you and I was just like, stay out of it, stay out of it. And, 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 and the reason why I was saying that is because this is when, when the abuse had got really, really bad. Mm -hmm. um, and I was afraid that he was going to kill me at this point. Um, I was jumping out of cars. I remember one time, um, the most scariest, scariest moment uh, of my life we were in a car we were in a camaro a 1989 rally sport camaro which is really compact in the inside mm -hmm. and he was driving and i was on the passenger side and i don't know where he got this knife from um all i know is the blade was about that thick and all I could see was the blade. I didn't even see the handle. And he was like, 
I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you, you know? And he kept saying that and he kept swinging the knife in the chair, swinging the knife. And I, God was in that car. Mm. If I tell you God was in there, Joan, I was like matrix. Every time he would swing, I would be moving and moving. Um, I ended up jumping out of the car. Mm. I ended up jumping out of the car and I wasn't far from one of his relatives house. Mm -hmm. So I ran to her house. And when I ran to her house, you know, she, she, you know, she held me, you know, and, 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 you know, put me in the house and he came and, um, she wouldn't let him in the house. And she was like, no, nope, you know, you know, and leave this car that the car happened to be my car. Mm -hmm. And so he called his friend to pick him up and she was like, okay, he's gone. And when we went back to that car, you know, she, she you know, she helped. When we went back to that car, Joan, mm -hmm. and I looked at that passenger seat, mm -hmm. and I saw all those holes in that car. And I just started thanking God, thanking God that I am alive. Mm -hmm. Because it was slit after slit after slit. I don't even know how it missed me. That's why I said God was in that car and he gave me life. He allowed me to live. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that, that, that was just, it, that was kind of, that was reality to me. Jesus that I had to get out. And then I started, you know, what I have to tell victims is you have to have a plan to get out. But this is, well, this was my breaking point. This is when I started planning on how I was going to get out. And at that time, I didn't know. I was like, oh my God, what can I do? You know, he knows where I work. He knows my friends. He knows everything about me. How can I get out? And, um, <laughs> later on um i end up well the end up, the way i end up getting out is i called my friend mm -hmm. a friend that i had since seventh grade and i called her and i said i need to move in i said i and i and i lied mm -hmm. i said i want to buy a house and I need to save my money and I need to stay a room in your house. Mm. And, she, and she said, how long? And I said, give me six months to a year. Mm -hmm. And she said, you know, I said, talk to, talk, talk to your, your, your husband, see if what he says. Mm -hmm. She said, don't worry about that. You're moving in. And she gave me a room in her house. Well, she didn't even know that she didn't even know that you wow and um eventually years later i end up telling her mm -hmm. um but in the in the the funny thing about it is she knew before i did she said oh he wasn't gonna come over there with that oh no he wasn't gonna do that <laughs> and because her man and, was in the house, right? She was married. She had the. It was married, mm -hmm. and she. Um, they, they they didn't have that kind of foolishness in their life, and mm -hmm. they were they wouldn't gonna put up with that. And I moved there, and um. And we worked at the same location, at the time, mm -hmm. and so I would ride with her to work, mm -hmm. to and from work. Mm -hmm. Lunch. We went to lunch together. And I'm sure he was following me, but never gave me a problem. Because he couldn't get next to you. He couldn't get you in this. In he that would not problem. do that. Mm -mm. Not, not with them. Has he ever been arrested for that, for domestic violence? Not with me. Mm -mm. Okay, so all of those years, he, he skipped the system. He never was arrested for it. So when so when the police were call, was called because I know you have to find out is different laws in different states dealing with domestic violence. 
So if you have, uh, if they have a, like something in their name or a bill or their name is on a house or something like that, they can't ask ne neither one of you to leave, right? They just tell you go sleep out and, you know, just go sleep. Back then, back then um, I, I heard about that now, but back then, mm -hmm. um, police weren't doing anything about that. Um, he would leave. He would always leave before the police would come if someone would call the police. Mm -hmm. And they would, they would, you know, uh, you know, basically say, you know, lock the door, don't let him in. If he call, call us back. I mean, if he come back, call us. Um, I don't even remember them really taking a report, you know, saying, you know, or even questioning me saying, okay, you know, we're going to go get this guy. Tell us where he's hanging out at. Tell us something about him. I don't remember any of that, you know. Um, but, but I have to say this. Um, a lot of times, um, the, the abuse was, it wasn't noticeable um, a lot of times. Like, I remember one time he bit me on my leg in a fight and he bit me and I had that mark on my leg for months months and um I think that he had got to a point where he didn't want people to know and so he would hit me in areas like my arms and things would be bruised but he would no longer uh, you know hit me in my face in my head he would hit me in the back of my head you know things like that but uh, not in my face. So when you broke away, and thank God you did, and thank God that he saved your life, oh, yeah. because this, mm -hmm. he could have, oh, yeah. could have killed you. Um, when you broke away, how long, what did you do to now heal yourselves, now heal the scars and the mental, the, the PST, the post-traumatic stress, PTS, that you had from this traumatic, what did you do? How did you take care of Nicole after you got away? Well, for, for a long time, I blocked it out. You know, I, I said, you know what? I'm just going to forget about it. It's the past. I'm out. I'm not going to uh, deal with it. Um, and then I started years, I started years later trying to date. Um, and I found out that, that I didn't trust men. I found out that I was angry. Um, I found out that, you know, um, I, I was in a bad space. I wasn't healthy. And so um, I, I did get counseling. I went and got counseling. Um, and I started talking about it. You know, I, you know, because you hold it in for so many years and, 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 and it becomes bad inside of you, you know, and once you start releasing it, actually you feel better. You feel better. You cry it out. I cried many, 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 many nights, especially reliving the events. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been, I've been choked to the point where you know, blood and white stuff would, would be coming out of my mouth. And I played dead because I felt, you know, if I would continue to scream or, or, or you know, uh, try to get away, he was going to kill me. And I remember one time he, he was choking me so bad till um, I had to play dead because I felt like I was going to die. And the only thing that I was thinking about was, wow, my mom, my mom, you think about family, you know, my mom's going to be like, oh my God, you know, um, I thought about, you know, um, you know, what people was going to say and, and, you know, and, 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 you know, my family mostly. Um, but I, I had to lay there and be still and, and play like I was dead. And I remember, you know, waking up the next day 
and smelling breakfast. <laughs> and it's like, you know, like it never happened. Yeah. And, and, and you, you get to a point where it's almost like you're just going through the motions. You're just going through the motions. I wasn't happy anymore. I would smile when, when I was with my friends, but the whole time I was miserable, miserable inside, afraid that when I go home, what's going to happen, you know, um, it was some real dark, dark times, dark, dark, dark times. You know, I think mm -hmm. that, you know, when we were growing up, you know, mama would tell us, you know, what goes on in the house stays in the house. But oh, yeah. we're living in a time now, it's time to come out of the house and get whatever oh, is not, you know, is unclean outside of your house, make sure that you get help for you and the children because you know witnessing domestic abuse as a child it can be very traumatic just like you said um like that the triggers that you have that comes from it like i the, one of the triggers i have is witch hazel i can't stand the smell witch hazel because you know when you had the black eyes you know you put mm. the witch hazel on um mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. you are mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. courageous to actually tell your story and you know it just makes me want to just weep um, for you because, but, but I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I'm not going to go there, but, but, but you are so strong to now reach back to others because a lot of times we are witnessing domestic abuse as a teenager that was happening way back then. And it's still mm -hmm. happening where, you know, I, I can't imagine a young teenager, 14, 15, even 16, you know, actually portraying the, 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 the pattern of their father or what they seen, you know, to happen in their household. And it's just, you know, you know, tell us about that event that you have coming up and what is, I, I assume that this is the motivation why you go forth oh, yeah. here and do something on, uh, in the month of October. Yes. And, you know, um, this event that I'm, that I'm preparing, it will be October the 24th at um, Sam Wiley Park in Cleveland, Texas. And I'm so excited about this. And more so, uh, the reason is because, you know, every year, I, like I said, I go around and, and, and speak about domestic violence. And I just feel like it's not enough. The word is not getting out. Um, we're not watching out for our sisters. And that was one of the reasons why I named it Sisterhood Watch, is that us as women, we have to look out for one another. We have to listen to one another. And the only way you can help a domestic violence victim is to listen and, 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 and help them prepare to get out. But if they don't have the information, if they don't have the support, they're not going to be able to make it out. Mm -hmm. And so it's up to us. You know, a lot of domestic violence victims won't even tell you what they're going through. You, 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 you'll be a neighbor, you'll be an innocent bystander at a store and you may see it happen. You may, you know, hear from a friend or hear from, but you're very seldomly, are you going to hear from a victim say, hey, you know what, he hits me. And so it's our duty. It's our duty. Mm -hmm. Because when you're in that type of relationship, and you're fearing for your life and you're being controlled and you're and 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 you're being abused you don't you don't think you have a way out you don't think you have a way out and it wasn't until my friend stepped up and let me move into her place that i felt secure um and so this event i want to put the word out I want it to be an awareness day where we just, you know, get all this information about domestic violence, where we listen to stories to inspire others to get out, to inspire others to help, 
and support victims. Um, and I'm, I'm going to have a, some poets there. And, you know, I think poetry is worst of soul of the soul. And, you know, if you hear, you know, what it does to families of the victims, if you hear what it does, um, you know, just to innocent people that listen to, you know, just the other day, uh, one of my friends told me that a 19 year old girl was murdered by her boyfriend and the father had to bury her. And I said, 19, and I know it's happening and it's happening more so now than it was then. But 19, you're just living, you're just starting your life. Who knows about love? I mean, you know, can it be? The young lady that I am um, honoring on October the 24th, her name is Brianka McBride. She died by her boyfriend that she only was with for eight months. They didn't even really, how could you even really know somebody eight months for you to kill them? One gunshot uh, to the head at 25, murdered, gone. And, and this is why I'm so inspired to tell my story. I'm grateful to be here. I was in those spaces where my life could have been taken and they're not here they're not here and they can't speak and they were taken away from their family and so i owe it to them to speak out you know i owe it to myself it's a self-healing this is healing to me you know it used to be a time where i couldn't even tell my story without crying and someone told me, you know why, you know why that happens? And that happens because you haven't healed properly. And so, you know, now I'm focused more on the awareness and, and trying to stop this monster. Because if we don't stick together and we don't speak up and speak out against domestic violence, it's gonna continue to happen. We're gonna continue to lose women and now men. We're gonna continue damaging our children. We're gonna raise a generation of abusers because it's a learned behavior. You see it happen, you're gonna perpetrate that. Nine, out, nine times out of 10. And so it's time out. It's time to say no more and break the cycle. And that's why I'm doing it, Joan. It's cause I'm, I'm gonna do everything I can to try to break the cycle. And we're standing there right with you to break the cycle and we say no more. No more. No more. Uh -huh. There are so many resources today where is that, you know, they're actually helping like everyone that actually calls in the hotline or go to a shelter, they're doing something today because they want to make sure you get out, especially mm -hmm. like you said, doing COVID, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and, and COVID, Joan, since COVID, domestic violence has risen. Absolutely. Um, tremendously. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's very important for us to get them the phone numbers. I mean, they have all kinds of measures in, in place now. They have, you know, if you can call some of these hotlines, you know, um, once you get on there, they can, they can, they can get you shelters. They can, um, for you and your children, if you have children, mm -hmm. um, they can provide shelter for you. Um, now, a days, um, they even give money, mm -hmm. you know, for victims. I was reading that. The, um, they, well, I was, EBT, I was reading that, that they would, they would give you EBT. Yeah. yeah. To get on yes, your Yes, yes. Transportation. Mm -hmm. Transportation. Um, you know, it's, it's a whole lot of resources out there 
for domestic violence victims. We just got to get them there. We got to get them there. But if we don't have these type of awareness days and we don't have these type of conversations, then, um, you know, they, they, they're alone. They're alone in a situation that they may not make it out of. They may not make it out of. And, you know, uh, one of the reasons why I do this, too, is I remember, you know, balling up in a corner and crying, mm. you know, crying about, you know, how can I get out or what can I do, you know, and feeling like, you know, I'm just going to die. I'm going to die. And that's a horrible feeling to have to live every day wondering if you're going to make it to the next day. Mm -hmm. you, know, I, you know, I think back um, one time when um, <laughs> I was, I was uh, with my girlfriend and we were walking and this guy was walking along of us and yeah, he was trying to, you know, talk to me. And out of nowhere, I felt somebody jumping on my back. And I start screaming to my girlfriend, get, get this. I'm thinking it's the guy's girlfriend, mm -hmm. you know, on my back and pulling me and hitting me. And I'm like, get this girl off of me. And as I turn around, it was him. And he drug me into, uh, he, was, he, he, he had jumped out of the limousine. So he was in the limousine. He drug me in the limousine. And I mean, he, he, he hit me and he, oh my God. Uh, there were other people in the limousine and my dress was all up and everybody could see my business. And, um, he was fighting me. It got to the point where, um, the limo may was going, but it wasn't going as fast. I jumped out of that limousine. I scratched up my legs. And as I jumped out of that limousine, I rolled over and I remember just looking at headlights and I was almost hit by the car that was following the limo. Mm. Well, God, it was just the grace. I mean, just inches from my face, the lights were, and it was so blinding. I couldn't even see who was getting out of the car. And I was just reaching out, help me, help me, you know? And I had scarred my legs up so bad. They were, they were bleeding. And um, the guy picked me up. And he put me in the car. And it just so happened to be someone very close to my abuser. And my abuser jumped out of the limo and ran up and it was like, let you know, get her out, get up. And he's and 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 the 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 guys, no, she's not getting out, you're not getting her, you need to leave, or I'm gonna do or it's gonna be me and you. And that was the first time that someone really stood up for me. And I remember that drive home when he was taking me home and he said, you got to leave him. You got to get out. And that, that, that stayed with me a long time. Um, and I, I wish I would have, you know, really left at that time um but but unfortunately i didn't and um you know the abuse kept going and the breaking point was i had a child i had a daughter and i remember he came home and my daughter was there and he he was ready to fight and i i told you earlier i never lifted a hand to defend myself because as a child i saw that if you do that you get you get you get it worse mm -hmm. so i i was always fearful of that and this particular night he wanted to fight but in front of my child which had never happened and that was my breaking point i refused to let him hit me in front of my child. And I picked up a knife and I told him, if you come near me, I'm gonna kill you. And I meant every word of it. 
and I never stood up to him. And do you know that night he left? And that was the first time that I ever stood up to him. And I knew then that I had to leave. 